First of all, I would like to thank um, the staff speaker of the to believe for having me here at Boys Hair Regular, who inspired me to study this topic since 20, around 2018 or before that, and everyone here in the workplace and on site. Okay. Um, like, um, this, this is introduced. Like, I will introduce some background on this that is Ramagian, but not only the Ramagian, the version of the, uh, the Thumburi Ramagian, but I will give you overall background of the Ramagian uh, and classic in Thailand. So, first, as you can see, I'm green. Um, this is the illustrated book manuscript depicting the, the, the picture of the Ravana or in Thai we call Totsakan and above is I think is a Param or Rama with a gilded on his forehead. This manus manuscript was kept nowadays is kept at the Museum for Asian Tisha Kunst Berlin. It's very, this is what we call a draft illustrated book before maybe it's adapted to be the mural painting or any other arts in like the mural painting on the wall in the monastery or so on. So what is the Ramagian and what is Ramagian relating to the Ramayana? The Ramakin is a Thai epic which derived from the Indian Ramayana. But in Thai we call Ramakin because we want to say like the glory, the honor of the Rama, because we focus on the story of, of uh, the story and the and the righteous of the Rama the most. The Ramayana was believably known since the early of 14th century according to the various later like, evident historical records, the arts, the culture, the sculpture, the mural painting, and, um, as a, and any others. So, Ramagian in Thai, sometimes you can see the difference of the, the, the words. Ramagian, sometimes we spell with A and with E. It's a Siamese epic derived from the Ramayana, a famous Sanskrit ep epic. Ramagian in Thai means the glory of Rama. Actually, in Thailand, the origin of the Ramagian, we do not know the exact date or the year of the Ramagian came to Thailand or even the this area. But however, there are clues, there are some clues to indicate the influence of the Ramagian. For instance, the toponyms in Thailand are somewhat related to character, characters in Ramagian, such as Kamparam means the Rama's cave. It's situated in the Sukhothai province in the north, in the central north of the Thailand. Moreover, names of the Siamese kings since the um, 13th century have applied the term Ram and Rama to their names such as Pakun Ram Kamhang of Sukhothai period or the first kingdom of Siam and the Somdet Prarama Thipadi of Ayutthaya until Bangkok period. This concept had originated from the divine king or the god king belief. This the Thai monarchy has adopted the divine and the concept of the righteous king for ruling over Siam for a long time. It is believed that kings are the avatar of God, in particular the Vishnu, the divine origin of Vishnu in Rama appearance. Thus, the story of Rama has been rewritten and retold again and again afterwards. Um, okay. You can see the picture on your right. It is like the, the same posture, the same movement as, uh, as the previous one, right? Okay. How can it change? Here, it is the same, the same, the same, the same posture. Above on the, above is the Param and the below is the Ravana, Ravana or in Thai we call Tosakan, which means um, 
the ogre has 10 faces, Toscana. So um, according to the previous slide, or the, the, the concept that I just mentioned, Rama Gien's story or even entirely focus on the story of Rama, right? Has influence upon many fields of art, literature, and in particular literature. As you see, Rama Gien had been created to various literary songs. Basically, the first one on your left is a chat, is to be written in Chan meter, which is the very archaic words for recitation in the poem mass performance and a shadow play. The character that you see in the column, the first column is Praram. In the poster that shooting his spear, shooting his arrow in the center of the puppet. The two characters below are Karuda. Karuda or Krut in Thai is considered to be um, Rama vehicles. The next one is the second column is Praram shooting his arrow again. It is the same posture as shown in the puppet, but the picture represents the character performing in a dramatic place or, or what we call in Thai Lakon. Ramagin has been adapted to be a dramatic play at least three versions afterwards. It has been performed several times later. And the third column is a manuscript containing another song of the Ramagin. It was written in an, what we call Nirachong. That is mean a love po poem describing lamentations caused by separation. Ramakin was adapted to be Nirasida, as known as or Rampanpila, by describing the Ramas or the Param's lamentations because Sira was abducted by Tosakan. And the last column, you can see the very unfamiliar script, even amongst the Thai people cannot read this script. It is a palm leaf manuscript containing the text of the folk tale of the Ramakin, the folk tale version of the Ramakin, which title is this version of Ramagian, I mean the folk tales of Ramagian Palakalam, it is widely known in the northeastern of Thailand, widespread to the Lao region. And this is the com uh, compilation of the, the, the story of Ramagian written in Ayutthaya period. In Thai, in Ayutthaya period, it is it has the time duration uh, among the 14th century to the 17th century. Um, among Thai scholars, always say this period is the prosperous period of us. So, uh, we found the four literary works adapted from the story of Rama or the story from of Rama Gyan. The first one is the Potlakon Ramagian, which is written to be a dramatic play. We found only one manuscript left at a, not far away from Bangkok, but just one temple in the, you know, in the any other province. The second one is the Kampak Ramagian, as I said, as I shown you the, the, the puppet shadow play in the previous slide which was written in the archaic meter used for only reciting for a shadow play and also for a cone performance. The third one is Ramagian Kamchan. It's very interesting because it was found as an old fragmented version cited in the traditional textbook Jindamani. Uh, we do not know or we didn't, we have not found any any entire Ramagian Kamshan, but we just found only a fragment in, inserted in a Thai textbook. And the last one is Raja Pilap Kamshan. Actually, um, this Raja Pilap, this story, I, I have found 10 manuscripts kept at the National Library of, of Thailand, and it contains the same text, but different um, handwriting. Uh, the next is, this is what manuscript that we would like to focus and talk about that. It is the manuscript of Ramagian, the version of King uh, Taksin, or Ramagian of Tonguri period. Um, 
we found only dispersion in turbulent periods because it is very short duration, just only 15 years. So after the fall of Ayutthaya, a new kingdom as known as uh, like the Turguri Kingdom was established by the King Baksin. And at that time, there was an attempt to gather people to recover art and culture again. Consequently, Ramagin was also rewritten for, 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 for a drama play or for La Um, According to historical records, we know that only that the King Baksin of Tonburi had gathered people from the south of Thailand to settle down in the Tonburi area. At the time, the troops of dancers also came to the central Tonburi as well. It is mentioned by the paper of the King Rama VI or the King Vashira would several years later say that. Um, the King Rama VI mentioned that he presumed the King Taksin wrote the Bodhlakon Ramagian, this, I mean, this copy, this is a copy, in order to showing off the troop of the high ranking official. I mean, he, he I mean, the King Taksin would like to set up his dancer troops to play the Ram, to play the Ram again, to, to perform the Ram again, in order to be like to compete with another troops. So go back to see the manuscript as a material. Its physical appearance, as you can see, is a leporello with a recta rectangle shape. Manuscript itself is made of koi paper, which is a local tree widely used around the center of Thailand. Its front cover is missing, whereas the back cover is gilded. The four side edges are gilded also. But if you turn up and look into the text, you will see the main text were written with a golden ink entire story. However, the last page on the verse of which contains the color phone at the end was written with only with a yellow ink. Okay, this is what I just said, as I just mentioned, this is the first page of the, 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 the rector site. It is, um, it is the, this page shows up the color phone indicating the date of the composition by the king. It said Sunday, the first day of the vaccine moon, the sixth lunar month, Tula Sakarat, 1132, the year of tiger, which corresponds to the 25th April, 1770. And then uh, on in the yellow circle, it is the color phone um, indicates the, the composition date. And then they enter the start of the, the chapter of the Ram again here. I will explain later. And this is the last page of the the last page of this manuscript. It can it's on the versal side. It was written with a yellow ink, not the golden ink anymore. Um, here it say the color phone mentioned the completion of date. You can see that the first page indicated the, 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 the composition date, but the end it is the completion date. What does it mean? The completion date is Sunday, the eighth day of the waning moon, the 12th lunar month, Tula Sakarat 1142, the year of red, which corresponds to the 19 November 1780. Furthermore, it also contains the scribe's name, which have three persons, namely Neshet, who writes the golden ink, Kun Sara Prasad and Kun Mahasid, who is the name of the proofreaders. And it also contains that this entire text were proofread, proofread three times. So if you compare the last page, you can see like Dula Sakarat here, or the date 70, 1770, and then in this page, in this slide, you can see 1780. It means that the composition, uh, the composition desk was 10 years before it was, this manuscript was completed.
10 years before. Okay? And this is the mural painting. This is the picture of mural painting at the Temple of the Emerald Buddha. It's depicting the picture from the scene of the, was contained in this manuscript. The, uh, it is the Battle of Virun Zambang chapter and uh, the scenes of the Hanuman Flirts with Vanarin. Um, this is like the extract from the from 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 this manuscript. And the chapter of the Battle of Virun Zamba is very popular and very reproduced as a con performance several times. So let's see the manuscript containing the text of the Ramagya and the version of King Baksin. Actually, we nowadays uh, we have like five manuscripts containing the text of the dramatic plays. One is kept at Berlin here. The others are kept at the uh, National Library of Bangkok, Thailand. Um, the one is kept at Berlin is the volume ones. The manuscript number 333 kept in Berlin containing the first chapter or the chapter of the previous painting, the battle against Satasun and Virun Zambang. Both Satasun and Virun Zambang are augurs. Satasun is a friend of Toskan. As for Virun Zambang is a Toskan's nephew or the Ravana's nephew. In this chapter, the two augurs have had to battle with Param's troops. And the text of this chapter continues to the manuscript numbers 5, 530, and 531. The manuscript number 530 presents the chapter of Hanuman Flirts with Vanarin up to the chapter of uh, Tama Livarat arrive. Uh, instead of the volume 3, manuscript number 531 contains uh, 52 contents the text of Tama Livara just the case up to the chapter of the Toscan return, returns to his city or the Longa. These two manuscripts present a significant character that is Tama Livara, who is a Brahma, the grandfather of Toscan. However, I found that the manuscript number 532 and 533, or I would say the volume 4A and 4B, contain the same chapter, which is the Toscan for the Statue of Divinities, a sacred hill, up to Parak shot by Gabila Paspears. But the volume 4B, or the, 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 the last manuscript, is distinguished because all the manuscripts above, the volume 1, 2, 4A, were written in the golden ink, whereas the last one, the volume 4B, was written in yellow ink, not in golden ink. It has like the assume that it is possibly a pre-final of the volume 4B. And but not just the five manuscript uh, earlier, but there is, I think there is one manuscript is yet to be identified because when I have a look at the first published of the Ramagira dramatic play version of the King Baksin, it was published in 1941. It contains another chapter which titled Pramungkut and Pralop, as you can see the, the, the picture, called the Sacrificial Horse Sent by Pralam. But um, I actually never seen this manuscript. Um, the picture uh, shows the character of Pramungkut and Pralop. Pramungkut and Pralop, if you can see the, the, the character with a top knot over the head, these two boys are the Ramas or Param's uh, sons. It is the picture uh, of the uh, the picture from a golden lacquer cabinet in 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 Thailand. So um, in this slide, I will show you some like just. At the beginning part of the the, the Ramagian play, um, you will see that the text 
was written into a group of words in the blue line. Um, this was can be rearranged to a dramatic verses, as you can see in the other the, the, the high scripts below. Beside, apart from the text, the marker is shown to indicate a break. It is like the, the a special marker is shown to indicate a break or stop to change scenes to end dialogues or stanza. Furthermore, there is an action tune which indicates the action, the mood of characters, and dancers' movement. The action tune of some scenes is a solo dance that show how skillful dancer is. The action tune is in the, the, the highlight. It is a tune that, that indicate, indicate the, 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 char the movement of the characters. It also shows the character, character's name in, in, in its scenes as well. So, okay. this is, okay. So, after the 15 years of the Tonburi period, we're gonna go to the, the, uh, the new dynasty, which was uh, the Zakri dynasty of the Bangkok period. Um, actually, the terms Jagri in Thai basically refers to the god Vishnu. So to restore the varied branches of knowledge in the Bangkok period, the King Rama I, who the founder of the, of the Bangkok uh, kingdom, ordered his royal scribes to rewrite the dramatic play Ram again from the beginning to the end, from the beginning of the story to the end of the story. This, this version is considered to be the complete version of Ramagin in Thailand and to be the sign is literally canon since then. As you can see on the screen, it is um, the manuscript contain, containing the beginning of the, of the story of the Ramagin ver uh, Thai version. Here, this is kept, this manuscript kept uh, at the National Library of Thailand. So, so when the Ramagian of the Bangkok period was written, how do we know? Actually, the Ramagian version of the King Rama I after the King Thaksin has totally 170 manuscripts. All manuscripts are black, um, written in both yellow ink and white shop, not uh, no golden ink. The composition date appear on the last page of manuscript number uh, 117 or, or the last manuscript with faded white chalk, as you can see. But actually, we can carefully read it. And it says um, the composition date is the first lunar month, the second day of the waxing moon, Monday. The vice king started writing or even composing the story of Rama and Ravana in yeah, actually, in 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 the world, sometimes Thai um, language use Ravana instead of Thotsakan and Rama instead of Praram. Um, the composition that is corresponds to the Monday twenty November seventeen um, ninety seven. Yeah, and apart from that, after that. There are several versions of Ramagian in, in Thai. For example, Ramagian of the King Ramada's uh, Ramagian of the King Ramada second. Um, it was rewritten as a dramatic play as well, but not entire the story like the previous version, like the version of the King Ramada the, the first. In this version, the Ra King Rama the second just selected certain chapters to be rewritten, to be presented. And the Ramagian of the King Rama III was composed in kilometer in order to explain the bas reliefs of the Wat Kho uh, Monastery. The Ramagian of the King Rama the, uh, <laughs> the Fourth was also rewritten as a dramatic play, but I'm not sure it is not quite popular or maybe because um, basically the Dramatic play using 
used in performance, mostly adapted from the Ramagian version of the King Rama the First or the King Rama the Second. And the Ramagian of the King Rama the Fifth, it was also written in Chromito as well, but to describe the mural paintings at the Temple of the Emerald Buddha. And the last, which is like the version of the, the royal, I would say this is the last royal version. It is the Ramagian of the King Rama the Sixth. Um, in this version, it was written in Chan meters again as a recitation and a dialogue for Khon performance. And in this period, the king also researched, do his research and write his paper titled The Origin of the Ramagan as well. And of course, many other miscellaneous literary texts relating to the story, such as a didactic, didactic literature, Pali Son Nong in Thai. It means Pali is um, one character of the Rama size teaches his younger brother because he want to teach how to be um, a very good um, official, how to be served the king. Uh, and this is the mural painting, uh, Ramagya at the temple of the Emerald Buddha, which has like the, 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 the clone, the clone Ramagya describing uh, what is the, uh, the, the describing the title or the chapter of each um, each picture, each mural painting. This is the the chapter of the Tao Shano. This is the beginning of the, 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 the story of Ramakian. Um the when the Tao Shano in a circle plowing the, the the ground to find uh Sita as a baby laying in the, the, the casket. And then when he saw the Sita, he find the Sita, he bring her back to his city and adopted her. And these are the Khon masks, usually performed in, in, in Khon performance. Each mask represent different characters. For example, um, on your left, it is the yellow mask represent Palak, who is the, the younger brother of the, the Param. And the uh, a uh, purple one is the Pasatru. He, he he's he's a twin of the Pralak, but has a uh, different colors. And on your right, it is the the Pralak and Palam. Palam or Rama is in the, the 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 green face, the green mask, whereas Palak in the the yellow mask. And this is the mask of the the leading characters. The rice is a uh, Hanuman, uh, a monkey who is the uh, who is a minister of the in this Ramagian and the two the left the right the two on the right is the like the mask of the Tosakan. Um, basically Tosakan wear green mask um, but there's one chapter maybe um, it is like the when he when the Tosaka or the Ravana flirts with Nang Sida, he will um, has his his solo dance. Then at the time he will wear um, a golden mask, a golden face. It is like the special special chapters to show the skillful and the beautiful, the smart of the Tosaka movement. And this is like. This is one of the highlight scene of Khon performance. Um, on your left, it is the battle scene between Param and Tosakan, or between Rama and Ravana. Um, this is the like the flying battle action. And if you notice, you see the Param does not wear Khon mask. Why? Because nowadays the performance of Khon has been adapted to Lakhon already. It means that sometimes. When you, you can see women perform in con performance and scripts like the reciting recitation has been used for the con only, has been adapted to, to use for the con as well. Um, so the recitation for con and the dramatic play 
will be integrated together from so um, in the cone uh, in the cone performance nowadays they use the script from a dramatic play um, yeah but some but some yeah but sometimes they use both like the both the dialogues the recitation and the dramatic plays um, integrated together. And um, okay, last but not least, it is the the highlight of the cone. It is the battle scene with the Rama troops. Um, I would like to stop my presentation here and um, thank you very much. And actually, I have like um, a short video clips. Yeah. So I have a short video clips to show the how the the text from the Ramagian of the Tonburi period was is produced to be a cone performance. So let's see here. Okay. So the person under the great umbrella is a uh, pralam and um virun jambang virun jambang is the toskan um yeah is a toskan nephew is here is on your your right he was he is defeated by pralam because rama or pralam just shot his by uh just shot him by his arrow I will go back. I'm not sure. Have you seen the the when he when when Rama shoots his arrow to 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 the ogre? <laughs> the recitation uh, in in cone performance um in thai we call um bot pa but you can see that the 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 the, perform, the performers like the param and palak doesn't don't do not wear any mask so it means that it makes between the like the the style, the format of the the play, the drama play, to 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 be a cone mask. Well, can die, so die, look now. Nam asu chulang, o lai lang, long a pak. This is the like the Virun Zambang. Um, this is like this chapter is cut from the, the scene of the first volume of the King uh the Ramagan of the King Taksin. But in my opinion, 
it would be adapted from the since the from the version of King Taizin to be the version of the King Rama the first, and then um, before they perform in this day on this stage, they will polish up the dramatic play again to you know to be to suit to pr proper for 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 each performance. Okay, I will uh, end of my talk here. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, wunderbar. Guten Abend. Ah, okay. Okay, so um, good evening, everybody. So thank you very much for attending with, in such a large number. And um, I was told that this is the first time that a time manuscript was... Uh, the topic of the Cross-Asia Talks, and I want to congratulate the State Library that they finally found something interesting to present. And, <laughs> and of course, I want to join all the previous presenters in thanking the staff uh, of the State Library for the invitation and the practical support that they have rendered in the preparation of this presentation. And I also want to express my gratitude to um, our colleague from France, um, Dr. Elaine Supianut and uh, Dr. Gregory Mkailian for their assistance. And um, as the many volumes of the Verzeichnisse der Orientalischen Handschriften in Deutschland, as well as the previous Cross-Asia talks testify, um, German libraries and museums, including the State Library, store impressive collections of Oriental manuscripts, carefully acquired and curated by successive generations of experts. The, with regard to written material from Siam, the case is unfortunately rather different. And as uh, Professor Baron Teville uh, demonstrated in his uh, article from 2017 um, that was titled Cultural Goods and Flotsam, Early Time Manuscripts in Germany, and those who collected them, um, most written artifacts of Siamese origin that are preserved in German institutions today were acquired in a rather unsystematic fashion, usually by amateurs, and during the late 19th century only. So referring to this kind of material, Professor Tavir closed his article with the metaphor of debris, washed ashore by the currents of the ocean. Uh, the question whether we are dealing with uh, trash or treasure in the case of MS Awful 333, however, can emphatically be answered to the positive. As uh, I think the introduction by Mr. Tira has shown already, and I hope I will be able to con contribute to this uh, positive impression. So I have to change my script. Um, so now that, we, now that we had already a closer look at the text of the Berlin fragment and the cultural context, I think it is appropriate to broaden our perspective again and to examine the process by which the State Library came into the possession of this manuscript. Um, unfortunately, nothing is known about the whereabouts of the Ramakian manuscripts from the time of their manufacture in 1780 until the 1830s. Then, one volume, however, surfaced in May 1834 when two Protestant missionaries of German origin, uh, Karl Gützlaff and Ebert Hermann Röttger met in Singapore. While Karl Gützlaff had spent almost three years in Siam between 1828 and 1831, Röttger apparently never set foot on Siamese soil. Um, 
In the course of the meeting in Singapore, Gutzlaff handed over a number of Liporello manuscripts and palm leaf manuscripts to Redger and entrusted this task to um, send this collection to Berlin to his fellow missionary. On May 29th, 1834, Rutger handed over a freight box filled with Oriental manuscripts and Asian books to Captain Schildknecht, the shipmaster of the Danish sailing ship Matador. Soon afterwards, the ship must have set uh, out on its, on its long journey from Southeast Asia to Europe since it arrived in Germany by October of the same year. The freight box left Hamburg on November the 1st by overland mail and was received at the Royal Library in Berlin on November the 4th. So it just took three days in that early time. This is the, an engraving from the old library. Um, the following day, that is November the 5th, the library staff assigned accession numbers to the manuscripts they had just received from overseas. Um, in the case of the uh, Ramakian, this is the number 486. On November 6, Dr. Wilken the then Orientalist and librarian at the Royal Library gratefully acknowledged to the missionaries the receipt of the cargo and re requested more manuscripts, which the library pledged to pay for as well. And a few days later, Dr. Wilkin also informed the Prussian Minister of Culture about the service rendered by the missionaries to the library. And eventually the news was brought to the attention of the then King Friedrich Wilhelm III, the King of Prussia as well. So it went up to the highest authorities. Um, so what did the fright from Singapore actually consist of? Uh, among the papers in the file concerning the negotiations between the Royal Library and Karl Gutzlaff, we find this rather convoluted list of Asian manuscripts and printed matter sent to Berlin. And uh, I think quite a number of um, historians have worked on this already and uh, lost their mind trying to decipher this, which I tried as well. <laughs> um, I think quite successfully, uh, I want to add. Um, the entries concerning the manuscripts consist of tentative titles, like this one. Tentative genre attributions, so everything that, they, that Gutzlaff didn't know was called roman, novel or romance information on language, written material, and format, as well as occasionally one-sentence summaries of the content. So, like this one. Um, most of the manuscripts sent by Rutger and Gutzlaff to Berlin have already been examined and catalogued in the course of the past decades by the contrib contributors of the uh, Verzeichnisse der Orientalischen Handschriften in Deutschland series. And thanks to the kind assistance of Madame Hélène Soupianot, it was possible to close the gaps in uh, this table with regard to the Cambodian material as well. So these are usually the volumes in this uh, series, catalog series, and these are the ones that Madame Soupianot uh, contributed when I asked her for more information. Um, so besides the outstanding Ramakian manuscript, which is certainly not by accident the first one on the list, this is the Tomburi Ramakian. Um, the Siamese specimen include a language primer. This would be the Patom Koka. Um, translations from Christian scripture, a folk tale, an excerpt of a more sophisticated novel and a Pali text commonly used in pre-modern times in monastic education. So this one is probably from um, Siamese origin as well. Then there are two Cambodian manuscripts that consists apparently of a folk tale and a text of moral edification, these two here, the Satra Kankang Trai. And then according to the research who have worked on the uh, Burmese manuscripts already, the two palm leaf manuscripts, uh, these two, um, they reproduce the Nisaya text um, of the two two of the ten last birth stories of the Buddha, 
and this particular version of the Nisaya is attributed to the famous 15th century monk Aryavamsa. As I don't know Burmese, I cannot check this, but uh, maybe uh, the experts in the library will, maybe at a later occasion. And there are three manuscripts of Lao origin that also contain a folk tale as well as an apocryphal birth story, which belongs to the famous cycle of the so-called Panyasa Chadok or the 50 Jatakas. And these would be, this would be the apocryphal Jataka, and this is the novel. So, who were the two gentlemen involved in this transaction? So, um, I rely heavily for Hermann Röttger on this book by Alfred Wesselmann, who has done a ter terrific job in trying to collect this uh, information from various archives. So he was born in, on November 16th in Lengerich. Um, he was the son of a poor countryside family and received almost no education, but uh, soon after we get, afterwards began learning the craft of a carpenter. And due to his very tall stature, he was uh, chosen to serve in the Guards Regiment in Berlin in 1822. So he had like what we call in German Garde format. Uh, there in Berlin, he met his future wife, Emilia Bayerhaus, who was working as a cook in the royal household and due to her family connections of much higher social status than he was. Between 1826 and 1829, Rutger received training at the Missionary Institute of Johannes Jenike, and then the following three years, until 1833, he uh, continued his studies in preparation for his missionary work in Rotterdam. He arrived in Batavia in August of 1832. He studied Chinese and Malay, and he also worked in the hospital that belonged to the Dutch colonial administration. From 1834 onwards, his missionary work was centered in Riau, and it, it is exactly at that time when he met Karl Gutzlev in Singapore in May of 1834, where the manuscripts changed hands. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, information rose up through the ranks of the uh, uh, Prussian administration. Um, so being informed about the service rendered by Rutger and Gutzlaff to the Royal Library, King Wilhelm III donated a substantial sum of money to the Bayerhaus family so that Rutger's fiancé, who was still staying back home in Prussia, could be sent over to the Dutch East Indies. And on December 13th, 1835, Rutger was finally married to Emilia Bayerhaus. The couple built a church, a hospital, and provided uh, basic education to the children of the Chinese diaspora at that place. And then, um, 1842, Rutger finally returned to Germany, and then he pursued a career in the um, ecclesiastic hierarchy. I think I have to bring something between. When I talked to people working on Southeast Asian studies and affairs, nobody had ever know, heard of uh, Eberhard Hermann Röttger. Um, he is absolutely no household name, uh, quite the contrary to Karl Gutzlaff, whom we are talking about now. He was a little bit la uh, later, in 1803, in Pritz. Uh, this is a place now uh, in the Polish Republic. Um, after finishing elementary schooling, he started to learn, learn the craft of a settler, so also a very low social back, background. And when the King of Prussia, King Friedrich Wilhelm III, visited the city of Stettin, Karl Gutzlaff stormed towards the carriage of the king and presented a poem in praise of the king. And this uh, gained him the attention of the authorities who would uh, later support his career. So, well, you have to be daring to, to make your, to your life. Um, with royal patronage he, and financial support, he took up his uh, education at the Missionary Institute of Johannes Jenik in Berlin as well. And he also went to Rotterdam to further his studies. And he also, like Rutger, was sent to the Dutch Indies to work there. He arrived a few, few years later in 1827. And he also learned, started to learn Chinese there. Between August 1828 and 1831, Gutzlaff, as a free missionary, conducted his work, his missionary work in Siam. And I'm sure that it was at that time that he acquired these manuscripts that I was talking about. 
he was intrigued by the idea to convert the population of China to Christianity, and then for that reason he left Siam. And the next few years, until 1839, he traveled around East Asia, entered the uh, Chinese Empire in a clandestine fashion, trying to uh, probe the situation on the ground, whether he might have any success in missionary work. He occasionally worked as a preacher, as a surgeon, and an interpreter for the East India Company. Sometimes, however, he also supported private smugglers of opium as an interpreter. So yeah, as, a, as an aspiring academic, you sometimes have to make uh, difficult choices, right? So during the Opium War, he also served the British Army as an interpreter. And then in 1843, when the British got uh, Hong Kong ceded to them, he entered the civil service there. Uh, the following year, 1844, he established the Chinese Union in order to train Chinese men to become itinerary preachers and distributors of Chinese Christian literature inside China. Um, then he returned to Europe for fundraising purposes, and he was in Europe between 1849 and 1850. And while he was in Europe, the corruption that uh, was festering the Chinese Union became apparent, and his big his uh, foster child it collapsed, almost collapsed. He returned uh, to Hong Kong, tried to uh, reform and salvage what was left of this Chinese Union, but uh, it was of no avail. He died on August 9th, 1851 in Hong Kong. Um, so most of the information that is available about uh, Karl Gützlaff's time and work in Siam is drawn from Gützlaff's own report on his three years in three years of residence in the country. This one. Um, then there is the published diary of his fellow missionary, Jacob Tomlin, um, and some letters that Gutzlaff wrote to Tomlin, as well as an essay written by Gutzlaff on the Siamese language, this one. Um, however, Gutzlaff's attempt at missionary work in Siam did not start particularly well because absolutely nobody in Bangkok dared to rent out a living place for him, so he had no house to, to stay at. Um, people were obviously afraid of this foreign newcomer, and uh, in the end, the Portuguese consul, however, he allowed them to stay in a two-room wooden cottage by the river. Um, I don't know where this was located. I just assume that it was somewhere close to the Portuguese consulate, which is situated there. This is, by the way, is a contemporary map from the 1830s. Um, this place, this cottage, um, became the base from where the Protestant missionaries ventured out into the countryside to preach and distribute, distribute books on Christianity. It also served as a provisional medical station where sick people from Bangkok and all over the surrounding area flocked to be examined and treated. This, uh, Gutzlaff's description of Siam and its inhabitants is surprisingly rich in detail and insight, given that it's just only 25 pages long or uh, better short. Uh, in his report, Gutzlaff touches upon a great variety of topics, such as the role of Buddhism, in society, the relations between the Siamese state and the East India Company, as well as neighboring countries, the recent war against the Kingdom of Yantian, the history and prospect of Christianity in Siam, as well as the junk trade that connected Siamese kingdom with China. Gutzler furthermore spent a lot of space describing the various people he came to live under the domination of the uh, Siamese crown, um, he mentions, for example, the local Portuguese community, the Chinese, the Mon, Burmese, the Malays, the Lao, and the Khmer. Um, well, a rather curious feature of Gutzlaff's journal uh, are his brief characterizations of members of the Siamese ruling class, among those who invited him to conversations on religious matters or medical treatment. Gutzlaff could count um, the sons and brothers of former and incumbent kings, high-ranking ministers and their relations, as well as foreign aristocrats. Um, just as most contemporary Siamese subjects, Gutzlaff was particularly impressed with the open-minded and industrious princes Chutamani and Kmongkut, as well as the Cambodian prince Praong Duang, 
all of them would become kings of their countries, respectively. So, since the main objective of the missionary sojourn in Siam was to proselytize among the local population, they put great effort in learning the most common languages. Together with his, together with his wife Maria Newell, his fellow missionaries and assistants of local scholars, Gutzlaff even sought to translate the entire Bible into Siamese, Lao, and Khmer, um, with the aim explicitly stated by Gutzlaff. Uh, was not to produce a sophisticated or even elegant prose, but to imitate the language of ordinary people as authentic as possible. I have to go back on this one. There's a quote. Lately I made the discovery of books written almost in the language of the people. This filled me with thankfulness to the Lord because I understand them and I can model the diction of the translation after them. I ordered a great many copies to be made with the intention of studying them closely. Um, one specimen of the missionary's translation effort I have put in here, I cannot go into the detail, those among you who know Thai will probably uh, notice very easily that um, it's indeed a very, very simple language. Uh, it's nothing that you would expect from like a Buddhist text where the qualities of the Buddha are described in, with great effusion. It's really very crude in a way. Um, in the course of their dual function as preachers and providers of medical care, and as a result of their genuine interest in Asian languages, the Protestant missionaries acquired a fair amount of knowledge about the manuscript cultures of the people of the Indochinese Peninsula. Uh, Tomlin and Gutzlaff left uh, many remarks in their uh, writings about the languages and traditions of the Burmese, the Lao, and Cambodians. Um, I think we don't have the time to go through all these. Um, I can, if you're interested, I can send you the, the references. A practical consequence of Gutzlaff's desire to master the Siamese language was his familiarity with a considerable number of literary texts, which he grouped into three categories based not so much on the gravitas of the content or the talent of the composers, but rather on the distance of their respective diction from spoken vernacular. The list of literary works written in an allegedly underdawned style is comparatively long, while the more artistic, intricate texts are less numerous and a class of its own, according to Gutzlaff, were libretti for stage plays. Uh, parts of uh, some of these titles that Gutzlaff mentioned in this list, um, in, in, the, in this article on the Siamese language, were among the manuscripts sent to Berlin in 1834. So I have indicated them by putting them in bold script. This might be the one, this might actually be the Tonburi Ramakian. I'm going back on this again. And there is Pra, well, his, <laughs> his rendition is not that the one that we would do today. It's Pra Paimani. This should actually be Pra Pratom Koka. This is Lin Tong. This is actually a Lao text that so shouldn't be in there at all. And this is Chanta Krop. Then, So despite the fact that the missionaries left a considerable amount of information about their time and work in Siam, I was not able to establish under what circumstances Gutzlaff came into the possession of the first volume of the Tomburi Ramakian, the one that is actually the topic of today's presentation. In his letters to Tomlin, Gutzlaff repeatedly mentions his successes in, for example, obtaining copies of Siamese literary works, making Burmese monks copy religious manuscripts for him and in using Siamese monks to translate Pali texts into Siamese. In all these instances, Gutzlaff seems to have affected the desired outcome and cooperation by means of financial incentives. Um, some manuscripts, furthermore, might have been gifts by grateful patrons, like in the case of the Cambodian princes Ong Im and Ong Duang. Um, ap apparently, the, um, the, the son of Ong Im was sick and it seems that the missionaries were able to cure him. And then there was an exchange of gifts of manuscripts. 
In one of Gützler's letters to Tomlin, we also find the only reference that could be interpreted as an allusion to the Tonburi Ramakian. Praising the talents of one of his assistants, Gützler wrote, the Cambodian removes everything which has a foreign appearance, writes a neater and more correct hand than the best copy of your Prasamut, and works from seven in the morning till eight in the evening. So, um, this is from the list that uh, we find in the file concerning the acquisition of the manuscript, and this is written on the manuscript itself. So, maybe this term, Prasamut, even though it does not refer to the Ramakian at all, it just means like the noble volume, something like that, um, is also mentioned here. But as you can see on the list, he used this several times, so it's not exact, entirely sure that it would be this one. But given the fact that among all these Siamese manuscripts that he was able to collect, the Tonburi, Tonburi Ramakian is by far the most valuable, the most precious one. Uh, something written in gold is very seldom especially from that time. So uh, it might be that he is referring to this manuscript. Um, as the title of the presentation suggests, I want to come to the end with the aftermath of the discovery. Well, it seems that after the arrival of the Tonvi Ramakian in Berlin in 1834, the fragment fell into complete oblivion. I've never found any reference that anybody has worked on this before. So more than a century passed until this manuscript finally entered the record in 1963 in Professor Klaus Weng's catalog of Siamese manuscripts in German libraries, which is the volume nine in the Verzeichnisse der Orientalischen Handschriften in Germany series. Then digital images of MS Orfol 333 were prepared in 2012. I paid for this work, actually. And uh, a few years later, the news of the manuscript's existence finally reached Thailand, too. Um, the first edition of the fragments text was effected in 2016 by uh, Rirai Praiwan, a professor of Rajapat University Tonburi campus, and a second revised and enlarged uh, edition was printed and disseminated the following year. So, this is the lady. And this is the book, the edition. This is only the text of this one, this volume that is in Berlin. As you can see, this is the one that they are handing it out. Then in uh, 2018, the Fine Arts Department uh, published an edition which for the first time combined the text of the Berlin fragment together with the textual material of the four volumes that are still kept in the National Library of Thailand. And what is most gratifying to notice However, is that uh, scholars of literature have begun to include the new material of the Berlin fragment in their studies as well. So in her 2020 book on Thai literature, for example, the late professor uh, Rinri Thai uh, Sachapan undertook a fresh look at the reconstituted Ramakian from the Tonbury period. And with that, I would like to finish and uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Mm -hmm.